In August 2017, L'Oreal Paris broke new ground by featuring an up-and-coming transgender model and activist as the face of a new beauty campaign, but less than a week later, she is fired amidst accusations of racism after she branded white people as the most violent and oppressive force of nature on earth. This incident introduced the world to Monroe Bergdorf, at the time only a small figure in the world of intersectional activism, but would soon become a leading name. Monroe's career has generated a huge amount of controversy, and despite the multiple scandals she's been embroiled in, her profile has only got stronger in the eyes of progressives worldwide. Monroe has followed in the footsteps of other glamorous trans activists, such as Paris Lees, Laverne Cox and Carmen Carrera. But what is it that sets her apart? What is her story? And is she the embodiment of progressive values, or simply taking advantage of a contentious political scene for her own personal gain? Monroe Bergdorf was born to a mixed-race couple in September 1987 and grew up in Stansted, Herefordshire. She attended an all-boys school, where she says she was regularly bullied and beaten up on account of her race and her femininity. It was during her childhood that she befriended Lloyd Dixon, who would go on to be well-known in London's drag circuit as Lady Lloyd. She went on to study English at the University of Brighton and started to identify herself as genderqueer around that time. Monroe later moved to London, where she took up a job in fashion PR for three years, and it was around this time that she became involved in London's drag scene, mostly as a DJ. She would perform at various queer events, including Tranny Shack at the now-defunct Madame Jojo's, OMFG at Shadow Lounge, and Runway at The Green. In 2011, whilst in the midst of London's glamorous drag scene, Monroe would begin her transition from male to female by starting to take hormones and later undergoing facial feminisation surgery, a process that was partially covered in a TV series called Drag Queens of London, which will become the first time Monroe will be exposed to a wider audience. Drag Queens of London was a show that ran for one season in early 2014. Each episode would centre around one of London's most prolific drag queens, taking a look into their lives on and off the stage. This included queens such as Lady Lloyd, Bag of Chips and Vanity Von Glow. Monroe was featured prominently in the show's fourth episode, which aired on the 13th of May 2014. During the episode, Monroe visits a consultant to discuss her upcoming facial feminisation surgery, but her transitioning journey takes a back seat to the drama between her and Lady Lloyd, when she finds out Lloyd had slept with her ex-boyfriend. The two have had falling out, but don't reconcile their differences. The episode ends with Monroe returning to Brighton to meet up with her friends from university. Following this appearance, Monroe would start to receive wider coverage in the mainstream media, where she was depicted as a model, DJ and trans activist. This included a video for CNN in May 2015 entitled My Transgender Life, where she talked about the difficulties she encountered during her transition. A few months later, she was invited to take part in a discussion hosted by The Guardian on how to be happy and transgender. The discussion included notable LGBT figures in the British media, including gay rights advocate Peter Tatchell, professional trans woman Paris Lees, and labour activist Owen Jones. She also made an appearance in an article in the Huffington Post celebrating LGBT History Month in 2016. Throughout her transition, Monroe also made a name for herself through a modelling career which began around 2014. There's little to find online about the brands she modelled for, although most were for independent designers, which saw her being featured in magazines such as Vogue. Through a combination of her modelling and activism work, Monroe would soon land a role for a high-profile beauty brand. The world was about to learn the name Monroe Bergdorf and they weren't going to like it. My name's Monroe Bergdorf, I'm from London. I am a DJ and um, activist. I'm also transgender and I do a lot of work within the media as a spokesperson for the community. On the 26th of August 2017, Monroe was prominently featured in L'Oreal's True Match campaign, alongside 27 other models with an aim to highlight diversity. Monroe in particular became the focal point of the campaign's online coverage, with several online outlets singling her out as a particular groundbreaker by being the first trans person to front a L'Oreal campaign in the UK. Monroe promoted the campaign several times on her own social media, thanking L'Oreal for the opportunity and saying, I am so proud to be doing my bit for transgender visibility in the media. The world is changing, and I like how the world is changing. 
Only four days later, news broke of an online message posted by Munro on Facebook, which she made following the Charlottesville alt-right protest weeks earlier. In the post, she said, Honestly, I don't have energy to talk about the racial violence of white people anymore. Yes, all white people. Because most of y'all don't even realise or refuse to acknowledge that your existence, privilege and success as a race is built on the backs, blood and death of people of colour. Your entire existence is drenched in racism. From microaggressions to terrorism, you guys built the blueprints for this shit. Come see me when you realise that racism isn't learned, it's inherited and consciously or unconsciously passed down through privilege. Once white people begin to admit that their race is the most violent and oppressive force of nature on earth, then we can talk. A L'Oreal insider told the Daily Mail that whilst the company didn't condone or agree with Munro's comments, dropping her could potentially be a PR disaster, placing them in a difficult position of seemingly endorsing racist comments or facing the blowback of dropping a mixed-race trans woman in the current political climate. But by the 1st of September, L'Oreal made the decision to drop Munro entirely from the campaign and removed all traces of her involvement, including her initial video. As predicted, the firing of Munro received a vicious response from progressive activists, who accused L'Oreal of not defending Munro's views and being against diversity. And in a scathing Facebook post, Munro condemned L'Oreal's actions, saying, Sit still and smile in a beauty campaign championing diversity, but don't actually speak about the fact that a lack of diversity is due to racism, or speak about the origins of racism. It'll cost you your job. This makeup brand cares about nothing but money. I urge you to boycott L'Oreal Paris. I can't express how disappointed I am in their entire team in dealing with misquotes that were entirely placed out of context. In another post, Munro explained the context of the post was regarding white supremacists in Charlottesville and that she believes the success of the British Empire was at the expense of people of colour. Following her sacking, Munro would begin holding interviews with various media outlets highlighting her views, including The Guardian and Channel 4. In an interview with Victoria Derbyshire, she called out pop star Cheryl Cole, saying, I shouldn't be sacked for calling out racism when I was in a campaign that was meant to be championing diversity, especially when I was speaking about the violence of white people. But they've got Cheryl Cole on the campaign and she was actively convicted for punching a black woman in the face. Cheryl's PR team responded by saying they were disappointed Munro had decided to bring her into the controversy. An interview on Good Morning Britain on the 4th of September would boost her profile even further, when Piers Morgan accused her of labelling all white people as racists, all men as sexists, and all heterosexuals as homophobes. Who are you? With the greatest of respect to you, who are you to say that every straight white guy did not in the world that. is a... Well, you did. You said white people are racist due to socialisation in the same way that men are socialised to be sexist, heterosexual people are socialised to be homophobic. You are calling straight white guys like me a series of offensive stereotypical labels, which I find, I find very offensive. Less than two weeks after she lost her job with L'Oreal, Monroe was announced as the face of a new campaign with Villa Masca entitled Human Up. The brand, who had previous ties to Monroe, had defended her following a previous sacking by claiming her comments had been taken out of context. And Monroe would continue to be interviewed about her comments months later, including on This Week with Andrew Neil in October 2017, where she continued to claim all white people are racist. The controversy helped boost Monroe's profile from an obscure activist to a household LGBT figurehead, earning her new positions and speaking opportunities for months to come and it didn't take long for Monroe to be embroiled in yet another scandal, cementing her place amongst the LGBT elite. On the 27th of February 2018, Monroe was appointed as an LGBT advisor to the Labour Party, supporting the then Shadow Equalities Minister Dawn Butler. The move was championed by LGBT activists on the political left, but received criticism from the Conservative Party with the Vice Chairman Helen Grant drawing attention to a number of comments Munro had made on social media. This included her comments on how white people's entire existence is drenched in racism, but she also highlighted a tweet where Munro attacked LGBT Conservatives, saying, Gay male Tories are a special kind of dickhead. It's actually quite astonishing. It didn't take long for further comments to be brought up from Monroe's past, including a post from 2010 where she said, Ever find that sometimes you're just not in the mood for a gay and their flapping arms? Queen, please. Calm down or I'll show you drama. And another aimed at a friend saying, How's your barren womb? Yes, we all know your little secret, hairy lesbian. Monroe issued an apology for some of the comments made a few days later, saying she had grown up a lot since they were first posted 
but by the 6th of March, just over a week after she was appointed as an LGBT advisor, she decided to step down from the role. In a post explaining her decision, she blames the conservative right-wing press and abuse she received online, saying, I refuse to be painted as a villain or used as a pawn in the press's efforts, especially at the Daily Mail, to discredit the Labour Party or discredit their transphobic rightist agendas. Around the same time as the Labour controversy, Monroe wrote an article for Grazia entitled Women Are Getting Feminism Wrong, where she claims feminism is ignoring the issues of trans women. As an example, she referenced the pink pussy hats used by protesters in the Women's March, which she saw as exclusionary to trans people. She also referenced a tweet she made the previous month, where she said, I also want to stress that if you do attend the protest, it is crucial that you do so with an intersectional mindset. Centering reproductive systems at the heart of these demonstrations is reductive and exclusionary. The tweets and article attracted criticism from gender critical and radical feminists, who accused Monroe of co-opting feminism. In May 2018, Monroe took part in a debate on Channel 4 as part of their Genderquake series, taking a look at the trans community. She was joined by former athlete Caitlyn Jenner, feminist writers Jermaine Greer and Sarah Ditton, and literal communist Ash Sarkar, with an audience consisting of a mixture of trans people and gender-critical feminists. Also, I was there as well. Y you can actually see me in that picture right there, sitting behind Jermaine Greer. Just wanted to point that out. During the filming, Monroe was asked about her comments on feminism not being inclusive enough for her liking, which drew heckling from the more gender-critical members of the audience. One instance saw Monroe specifically request gender-critical activist Posey Parker to be removed by security, although this didn't happen. The show drew widespread criticism online, and many Twitter users voiced their support for Monroe, who they saw as receiving an unfair level of abuse. As a part of the Genderquake series, Monroe presented a documentary called What Makes a Woman. The film covers Monroe's final facial feminization surgery on her forehead, showing footage of the surgery as well as her recovery. She also showcases her modelling career at a catwalk in New York. She then joined a focus group ran by a Cambridge University lecturer on gender, where women talk about what makes a woman. Some of the examples given by the group, such as being a mother or having breasts in a vagina, clearly concern Monroe. The group are then asked to hold up a sign showing what they think dictates gender. While some in the group use hormones or chromosomes, Monroe holds up a sign saying identity. The group then meet up in a pub, where one of the women tells Monroe that while she sees her as a woman, she still acknowledges that Monroe is a male. Monroe blames society for these views. The documentary then moves on to a protest outside a talk hosted by a gender critical feminist group called We Need to Talk. Monroe speaks to a number of protesters, then listens into the talk itself, where one of the speakers talks about being threatened outside. Throughout the talk, the protesters can be heard banging on doors, chanting no turfs on our turf. Monroe looks particularly uncomfortable when gender-critical trans person Miranda Yardley discusses the concept of autogynophilia, and leaves shortly after Posey Parker ends her speech. Monroe then met the organiser, Venice Allen, who discusses her concerns with self-ID. Monroe challenges this by saying trans women are more at risk from men than cisgender women, and that feminism isn't inclusive enough. Following the discussion, Monroe talks about a time early in her transition when she was raped. Finally, Monroe talked about the medical aspects of her transition, although refusing to disclose whether or not she's had gender reassignment surgery. She visits a university hospital in Germany, where she is classified as a transgender person following tests on her brain data. Despite the title, What Makes a Woman, the focus on the documentary is almost entirely on Monroe herself, putting her front and centre in the debate on trans rights. Less than nine months after the L'Oreal controversy, Monroe's profile was higher than ever before, and she wouldn't have to wait too long until another scandal came her way. On the 5th of June 2019, the NSPCC, a children's charity in the UK, announced a campaign focusing on children who reached them for help with gender and sexuality issues. Monroe was approached as an online influencer to help promote the campaign, which she tweeted her support for, saying, I'm excited to have the opportunity to let more kids know that they are not alone in how they feel. There are people who care, people who can help, and people who have been through the same things as you, so please don't suffer in silence. 
The campaign also included a video with Monroe, which has since been taken down. Monroe's appointment drew instant criticism from the gender critical movement, highlighting a photo shoot Monroe did with Playboy the year before as proof she was unsuitable for the role. But further concerns were raised after multiple messages surfaced from Twitter seemingly showing Monroe encouraging underage people to contact her directly. On the 7th of June, only two days after the initial announcement, the NSPCC publicly distanced themselves from Monroe, a personal record. In a statement, they said, Monroe has been referred to as a Childline Ambassador. At no point has she been an ambassador for the charity. She will have no ongoing relationship with Childline or the NSPCC. The NSPCC does not support, endorse or authorise any personal statements made by any celebrities who contribute to the campaign. In response to the sacking, Monroe accused the NSVCC of bowing to pressure from a transphobic hate group, and a representative claimed that Monroe's firing showed they didn't care about transgender children. The NSPCC would later issue a statement apologising for the way they handled the situation, which Monroe seemingly accepted. And it later emerged that the man responsible for hiring Monroe in the first place was found to have worn fetish gear to his job in a children's charity. Criticism of his actions were dismissed by the gay press as homophobia. But the controversy once again helped boost her career, earning her more talks, articles and appearances. In a video made for the BBC, Monroe claimed trans people were treated as second-class citizens, referencing her recent debacle as an example. Monroe's profile continues to rise, and is considered by The Independent to be the 8th most influential LGBT person and the most influential trans person in the UK to this day. Monroe Bergdorf has become an infamous and high-profile activist within the LGBT community, as seen by the numerous controversies she's been involved in. We've seen her past, but this leaves the question, just who is Monroe Bergdorf? Monroe is often labelled as a model, and in recent years, this is certainly a career she can claim as her own, having recently modelled for brands such as Calvin Klein. She's an online influencer, with followers numbering in the hundreds of thousands, and while she's sometimes called a DJ, this career has taken her back seat in recent years. But the term activist is the first thing anyone thinks of when her name is raised. Being an activist can be an easy path to get into, as all it takes is a form of self-declaration but her activism is particularly notable. Not for the positive messages on LGBT acceptance that she'd like you to believe, but rather a state of perpetual victimhood, one always associated with bad press, and what Monroe has centred her entire career around. It's important to note that whilst Monroe can claim to be a name within the LGBT community for a number of years, thanks to her connections within London's drag scene, this never broke out into the mainstream. Searching her SoundCloud account, which has been abandoned at this point, shows there was very little interest in her career as a DJ. But the event which made her a household name was the firing from L'Oreal. It's the first thing anyone thinks of when her name comes up. And it's from here that Monroe was able to build a career. Prior to the event, there were very few mainstream shows that would feature her, but she quickly found herself invited on networks watched by millions, debating alongside some of the biggest commentators in the country, and even fronting a documentary focused entirely on her within nine months of the controversy taking place. That's an impressive turnaround for someone who claims the whole world is against her based on her identity. I should also note that while she did engage in modelling prior to L'Oreal, which was what ultimately helped her get a job in the first place, it was never on the same level as what came afterwards. The current political climate we find ourselves in means there's never been a better time to be transgender, provided you have the right frame of mind. Painting yourself as a victim from invisible forces of oppression can give your profile more clout over people who are true champions of their identities, and it's easy to see how Monroe has been able to profit from what's happened to her. The only consequence of Monroe claiming white people are the most violent force of nature on earth, a statement that dehumanises an entire race of people, was more job opportunities. And when she stepped down from labour, based on comments from her own past, she successfully painted the episode as her hand being forced by the right wing. Again, her reward was more sympathy and exposure. Monroe's most notable roles rarely seem to last more than a week, and I can't help but feel a part of it is more than coincidence. But it would be foolish to simply write off Monroe as being only able to bank on her trans identity. Her most recognisable controversy was about race after all, but Monroe represents the very worst of intersectional identity politics. I've often talked about the progressive stack on my channel, the idea that within progressive movements, the more identities one holds, the more marginalised they are, meaning the more of a need to let them speak. Z who has the talking stick controls the conversation after all. 
and Monroe has done a good job at banking each of her intersecting identities from her race to her trans status to her sexuality which she now says is pansexual and even going so far as to use they slash them pronouns. As such, it's easy to see how Monroe can come out of each controversy virtually unscathed. Rather than face criticism for her actions, she can claim to be oppressed and then she can watch the job offers and virtue signals from woke commentators and companies come rolling in. This is a cycle which has repeated itself over her limited time in the spotlight and it's unlikely to go away anytime soon. So what this leaves us with is a cynical celebrity seemingly searching for her next source of trouble. All publicity is good publicity for Munro Bergdorf. An example of how one can break into the spotlight, finding fame and fortune based entirely around a toxic demand for intersectional victimhood. Monroe would continue to court controversy for many years to come, and could one day run the risk of overstepping the line by angering the very mob that keeps her employed. But until then, she remains the infamous face of the British transgender community, a glamorous victim and a master of playing to her audience. <laughs>